Good to have you here tonight, and um, I'm excited about this week, uh, what's going to take place, and you're going to you're going to be uh, excited as well. Uh, in your in your seat, and what I would like for us to do is always try to scrunch up a little bit. Uh, this this side needs help, okay? Uh, then we need more on this side. Uh, but uh, when the kids are dismissed in a little bit, uh, just kind of make your way toward the center if you can. And there's folders for everyone. Uh, and a pen for everyone uh, in that, and, and uh, Brother Rick Airwood will uh, share with you um, several things throughout this week. I hope you write down uh, that those helps. In that, you also see my responsibility and my goals and in that. So please utilize that folder that's there for you. But let's go ahead and uh, we're going to, let's all stand. We're going to have a word of prayer. And then Brother Larry Brubaker and his wife, LeVan, are here this week with us. Uh, through Sunday night, and uh, uh, he's one of a kind. All right, uh, he uh, you will you will glean from him. I guarantee you, you will be enthused, excited. You'll sing better than you ever thought you were going to sing, uh, just because of uh, his character. There's none like. I'm glad him and his wife are here <laughs> with us. I don't want to look behind me. <clears throat> yeah, we're gonna go ahead and pray. All right. And then he's going to come lead us in a song. Father, we give you all glory and praise tonight. Lord, you're just too good to us. And Lord, how do we really tell you outside of just saying thank you? Oh, Lord, our life should display that. Our life should live it. And Lord, we praise you for that. Lord, this week, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and Sunday, Lord, is a time for lessons, a time for teaching. Oh, Lord, we come to have fellowship. And certainly, Lord, the, the joy that we'll have being together but yet when it comes down to it, we need help in our marriages. Today, uh, the world is just changing rapidly. And in that, if the marriages are changing. And Father, let it not be named once among us that our marriage is come and breaking apart because uh, of worldly things. Lord, help us strengthen them to this week. Lord, as uh, Brother Rick gives us tools for our marriage. Uh, Lord, for the kids, I pray for Miss Kathy as she teaches them throughout the week. Lord, give her wisdom and uh, that would help unify and uh, just to, just solidify the family unit. Lord, we love you. Lord, we give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remain standing. I can hardly wait to see what's going to happen now. All right. <laughs> um, let me say, it's, it's overwhelming for my wife and me to be here. Uh, we look at your pastor and his wife and family, uh, and Bethany's here. Um, I got a picture of Bethany on my lap when she was five years old, and it's a special picture, and to have her here is really neat. Uh, I know Greg's not my son, but the Bible says I have no greater joy than to see my children walk in truth. And our relationship goes back a long way. And uh, I used to travel in evangelism a lot, and he was my assistant when I was gone. And the Lord developed a friendship, and whoever dreamed. I've reached two, two special times in my life the last couple weeks. When you're born in 1940, and you come to 2020, if you do the mathematician right, uh, I'm not 17 anymore, say. <laughs> and uh, after 27 years at Emmanuel Baptist Kings Mountain, I have officially retired. I have nobody telling me what to, well, I've got my wife, but, <laughs> but other than that, uh, I thought we've been married 57 years. We've been in the ministry, a number of different ministries, and always had a pastor or a boss. <laughs> um, take your hymnals, please. All right. And let's turn to 351. Now, I wave my hands, 351 in your hymnal. In a moment, we're going to sing. I do wave my hands when I, I lead. Uh, I hope with a purpose for you to follow. We always hold the last note of the song out together. It does take some of you longer than others to find it. So we'll wait on you, all right? 
and we get, and then we cut it off just like a great big congregational choir. That's what you're part of. We don't have a choir tonight. We hopefully have a choir by Sunday night. You, you who think you know how to sing, we're going to have a choir. We'll start practicing pretty soon. And but right now you're the choir. If you can sing soprano, if you can sing alto, tenor, bass, go ahead. Now, if you can't anything up with the melody, that's fine. But we're going to have a wonderful time in getting our hearts all ready. Pastor Rick. Pastor Rick is, well, there's not words to describe what he and his wife mean to us. But, uh, but anyway, it's this is this is just. I told Rick on the phone today, I don't think anything's going to be accomplished, but we're going to have a lot of fun together today. All right, you ready to sing since Jesus? If you are, say yes, sir. Yes, sir. 351, here we go. I shall go there to dwell, uh, I shall go there to dwell in that city. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. Wonderful. Wonderful. There's a new name written down in glory. I hope yours is, because mine sure is.
269. My, you are really singing well. That's exciting. This changed the mood. And whatever I told you is 200, and whatever I told you is wrong. Well, you take any number you want. All right, that'd be fine. But I prefer 296, okay. 296. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, did my Sovereign die. You may remain seated if you sing well. All right, go ahead. Ready, sing. Alas, and did. Was it for crimes? Was it? singing. We're going to try something. We're going to sing the last stanza. When we get to the chorus, I'm going to ask all the instruments to drop out. I want to hear you sing a cappella. Now, don't get nervous, and don't get scared, and don't quit. All right. I'm going to slow it down, and it'll be a pretty, a pretty ending. But drops of grief, but Take your time now at the cross, at the cross. Amen. Good. testimony. Thank you. Wonderful singing. Not bad with those instruments either. You going to come and help me? As they often say now, y'all pray for us. Because <laughs> we haven't had a chance to practice. We did, but you would never know it. But, uh, <laughs> but we have sung together often. We're going to get his wife up here soon too. And uh, we're going we're gonna to have a wonderful time, but uh, we'll get our hearts ready as Brother Rick will come in a little bit. Okay. Just to stream through. 
Well, it gets better and better, I'll tell you that. <laughs> the more we practice, I suppose it gets better and better. You, you know it's going to go up from here, amen? <laughs> well, I appreciate uh, them traveling all the way from North Carolina to be with us this week. And uh, it's a joy to have, have old friends from the ministry. Uh, they have been uh, an idol. They have been an icon for us and our family. And uh, God puts uh, certain people in your path at the right time. And uh, that's who they were for us. And I appreciate them. Brother Rick Irwood, I, uh, I knew him. I know him. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I, 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 uh, I knew him from when he was at Troy Baptist Temple. Uh, he probably didn't know me a whole lot. But uh, that's when we were uh, going to Calvary Chapel in Minster, and we would have uh, our teens come up and have uh, competition with them. But uh, Brother Rick is, is uh, one of these preachers where God, God gives certain preachers for certain things. And God has given him a sense and wisdom on family. And uh, I've asked him to come and to be a part of our family conference. And uh, something the Lord laid on my heart a while back ago, and I feel that our families today are, are very vulnerable um, and susceptible yes. of falling apart at, at, mm -hmm. at a whim's notice. Mm -hmm. And what causes that and, and who causes that? Normally it's the finger point problem. Uh, but it really has to come back to you and me. Where do I stand before the Lord, and what's my position, and where, where's my responsibilities lie before the Lord? And, and uh, so Brother Rick is going to share with us many things throughout these next sessions that I hope will be a help to each one of us. I have no doubt whether uh, you've been married 50-plus years or 50-plus or minutes, it doesn't matter. Whether you're single or whether you're, you're married, whether you're a single, divorced, and it doesn't matter. Sure. We all need it. Sure. And so Brother Rick is going to come, and I appreciate him. He's, he's officially retired. He's going to share that with you, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, and uh, he is now uh, traveling. He's with the missions board. I'm sure he'll share that with you as also. But we'll go ahead and dismiss our children at this time. Miss Kathy Henson was going to teach our children in the back, and uh, I know that she's looking forward to that. Nice. So y'all just run, wow. run, 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 go. <laughs> <laughs> Good All deal. Right. Good deal. <laughs> well, I, I do. I appreciate him coming uh, from Indiana and uh, moving to Georgia, right? Yeah, that's true. And, that's true. Uh, and yeah. you pray for them, and I know the Lord's got great things for us. Well, thank you, Pastor. So, okay, thank you so much, and it's so good to to be with you, and it's it's good to be with our friends, um, Larry and Lavanda. Uh, they've been part of our ministry for many, many years. They came first of all to our church in West Virginia the first time. Yeah, and then we had the big meeting in West Virginia uh, and um, then on to uh, Troy and then they've been with us also in Indianapolis. Thank you, Pastor, for the invite for these uh, few days. And it's good to see that we have uh, singles here, that we have young couples here, uh, that we have couples with children here. Uh, I have prayed about uh, what to preach about uh, this week and uh, really giving it to the Lord. And I thought about this verse as a theme verse. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And that's from Psalm 11. That's not my text tonight, but uh, we, I want to help you strengthen your families. Your pastor loves you. Uh, I know that we I have to be uh, conscientious of church growth and win souls, and I know we have to reach others, uh, but there's a strong attack on the home, and it has been going on since the Garden of Eden. And we cannot ever think that we can get by with how the devil does everything he can to destroy our lives, our marriages, our children. And so as we look at this, uh, we will see, obviously, that the three institutions that God has, has ordained since the beginning of time, the first one being the family, and the second one being the nation, a government, and the third being the church, those three things, when you look at it, you look at the news, go home and just watch the news, and you'll see that those three institutions 
are under heavy attack. And we cannot let up one bit. Now, here's my organization and my rhyme and reason to things uh, this week. Number one, I want to, first of all, tonight, lay down the premise about how Satan will hone in on your weaknesses and use them against you. We're going to see it from, the, from a Bible perspective. Because if I can convince you that the devil really is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, if I can convince you that the Bible really does say that and it, it's true, then you will be more sensitive to his methods of operation. So tonight is going to be how Satan worms his way into our life and he observes our weaknesses and he turns those weaknesses against us and he works them against us. And we all, listen now, we all have them. There's nobody in here without blind spots and without weaknesses. We all have them. If we all have them, let's admit it. And we all have a battle with this. And if we can take the first step in this conference about the family and identify how the devil is after you and your family and your marriage and your children and your grandchildren and any relationship you have with any human being that has to do with Christianity. He is after that. Tomorrow night, Lord willing, we'll look at a biblical view of marriage. What does the Bible say marriage should look like? How it defines marriage. And uh, then on Saturday, Lord willing, now all of this is subject to change as the spirit moves, okay? Uh, but um, Saturday morning, I want to deal with the perils of becoming passive parents and how dangerous that is. Uh, and so if you look there in your notebook, you can see that. There'll be a two, that's a two-part message on Saturday. Uh, and then uh, on Sunday... I want to speak to this matter of, of how, how, how we can know the will of God for our life and move forward from this conference forward. And so there's, there's some plotting and praying that I did with this. Now, the Lord may get in the midst of all this and things could change, but that's where we're headed and that's where your notebook uh, mentions. So let's deal tonight with Satan's personal attacks on our personal lives and our weaknesses. Take your Bibles and find Luke 22, please. Luke 22. And while you're finding Luke 22, one of my favorite stories of living in Troy, Ohio, came on a Friday around 5.30. I was in my office studying and Dolly calls and says, honey, we need one thing uh, for supper. Would you stop at Meyer? And I know all of you have been to Meyer. And years ago, if you remember, uh, they had before self-checkout lines and before um, the computer age, they would have a clerk that would do 12 items or less. How many of you remember the 12 items or less? Yeah. And so it was a Friday afternoon. It was busy. The two or three lines of 12 or less items were long, uh, you know, and so I got the one item and I'm standing in line and the, the, the leadership of Meyer is smart. They, they train their people well. Now, when you checked out of those lines, you would be facing a lottery cash register and a tobacco cash register. You'd be facing both of those. And the last thing you would have an opportunity to do would be Buy, buy your tobacco or, or buy, um, I was going to say a credit card, but it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, you know all about that, don't you? <laughs> I want to talk with you after the service, all right? <laughs> Sorry, Brother Larry, but you fell into that one. <laughs> so, so this lady, very large lady, she had a booming voice. She came over. And uh, she came to one of, those, one, one of us in those three lines, and she said she would say, Ma'am, I see you've just got uh, a couple of items. I'll, I'll take you at the lottery cash register. And she'd go over there and check them out, and she, she was really helping them. She was expediting things. 
Are you with me? She, she was being a good, a good employee. Well, she did that, and I, and I said the second time, I said, just as sure as the world, this lady's going to come right to me. And she did. And she came right to me and said, sir, I know she had just one item. I'll be happy to take you at the lottery cash register. And now I had a, dis I had a choice to make, didn't I? And I said, ma'am, that's okay. I'll just stay in line here. And she lifted up her voice and she said, you don't understand if I check you out over there, you will get out quicker. She was instructing me. <laughs> and by the time she got through with that, I, I decided that I would use it as an opportunity. Uh, I was using my inside voice until that moment. Then I decided to use my preacher voice. And I didn't tell her that I was a preacher, not that I'm ashamed of being one, but I just wanted her to know. And I said this to her real loud and I got everybody's attention. I said, ma'am, I'm a Christian. And if I go over there at the lottery cash register and check out my one item and someone comes in, they will think that I am buying a lottery ticket for Larry Brubaker. <laughs> they would think I'm buying a lottery ticket and ma'am, I don't want to do that. And she said, oh, I, I understand that. And she said, I'll be happy to take you at the tobacco register. <laughs> Now, by that time, I was feeling sorry for her husband. You know what I'm saying? Because I realized that she doesn't let things go very easily, does she? But I maintained my testimony, and I was grateful. I went home and told Dolly uh, that, uh, and I said, boy, the devil would have won a, could have won a real victory had I just let down the guard just a little, little bit. We're going to read a few verses tonight. I think they're the most revealing verses about the devil we have in the New Testament. It comes in the life of Peter. When Peter had been doing so well, he had left his fishing nets and followed Jesus. He had become a fisher of men. For three and a half years, he was in one symposium after another with our Lord. He was in seminary training classes. Jesus knew his potential. Matter of fact, Jesus knew what he would do in the future. And Jesus was constantly seeking to help Peter because he knew Peter's potential. All of us have great potential in this room. Regardless of where you are in your life, God has a plan and he has a purpose for your life. We'll end the conference in understanding God's purpose and plan in our life. And I want you to put these links together, I trust, in your mind and heart as, as we plunge into this text and find out and watch how Satan worked on Peter because of Peter's weaknesses. He, had, he observed them and then he exercised them. All right, let's begin reading in verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, notice he did not call him Cephas, he did not call him Peter. He called him Simon, his surname. He was trying to get his attention from the beginning. Behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. What does that mean? What does it mean for Satan to desire us to sift us as wheat? Tonight we're going to find out. We're going to learn exactly what those words in that verse means. But I have prayed for thee, the text says in the next verse, Jesus is speaking still, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. You see, he's looking into Peter's future, isn't he? And he said unto him, now Peter is talking in verse 33. Now watch what Peter says. Watch the arrogance that ekes out of him. He had been with the Lord for three and a half years. He had, he had walked on water. He had, saw, he had seen miracles after miracles. He had watched Jesus in his daily ministry. And look at the arrogance of a disciple who thought he was somebody. 
And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and unto death. Lord, I am ready to be a martyr for you. Peter was way out of his category. Jesus knew it. Notice what Jesus tells him in the last verse of our text. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Father, help us tonight. Realize that the devil is real. He is after us. Lord, he did everything he could to prevent anyone from coming and hearing this simple message. He was successful with some because some are not here. And I pray, dear God, that those that are, that, Lord, you would exercise their heart way beyond my ability. Lord, This I have no ability to, to move them at all. But the power of the word of God can. And I pray, dear God, that we would not look at ourselves as if we've got life, the Christian life, down pat, and that we do not need help. But I pray that we would all realize that if Peter could walk with him personally, pillow his head with him for three and a half years, and come to a critical time in his life where he would deny his Lord, that he would lie about knowing his Lord, and that he would even curse and say he did not know him. So how can in a moment's time can someone go from the miracles of our Savior to making a mess of his life as a disciple? None of us are beyond Peter's pattern. God help us to see that tonight, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I do not know your weaknesses. I know mine, and I find out more weaknesses on a regular basis. But you do know your weaknesses. If you will tell yourself the truth, every one of us, every man, every woman here, every one of us, we have weaknesses that if we do not identify in our life, Satan will use those weaknesses against us. While we are teaching Sunday school, serving the Lord, coming to church faithfully, while we're having family devotions, while we are praying, while we're teaching in the Sunday school department, anything that we do for the Lord, singing in the choir or singing uh, behind this uh, sacred desk, uh, God wants us to be aware of our weaknesses. None of us should be so arrogant that we think that we've got the Christian life down and doesn't need, we do not need God's help. We need him every single day. Now, I do want to deal with the theology of, of Satan, Satanology, just for a moment. Number one, I'm not an expert at it. And I've, I've left the topic alone in 41 years of ministry because I realize the devil is real. But I want you to know that unlike our Lord, he is not omniscient. He is not everywhere pr present. He cannot be. He's a person who can be at one place at a time. He is not omnipotent. He's not all-powerful, although he is powerful, but he is not all-powerful. When we read the book of Job, we realize that he could do no more to Job than what God will allow him. So then we know that also he's not omniscient or he's not all-knowing, but he does observe our lives. He looks for patterns. He looks for cheeks in our armor, so to speak. Why? Because he has fiery darts, right? Fiery darts that he aims at the chinks in our armor so that he can take us out of the battle for the Lord. So I want you to keep in mind that, yes, he has power and he has dominion. Can't read the book of Ephesians and not see that, that he's the prince and power of the air. But he has no more power than what God allows him. And he never supersedes the power of Almighty God. When you and I realize that, I think we can identify that we have an enemy and he's real and he works on us all the time, even when we do not realize he is working on our lives to destroy us, to destroy everything that we believe. Now, I want to illustrate this 
and show you how he does this. Now, I want you to put your thinking caps on just for a moment and, and go back with me to the garden. And what did he do? Eve, Eve became ignorant of God's will. And he did that by dealing with her mind. Now, pay close attention to this. He told her a lie because, and when he did, she became ill-informed of the word of God and the will of God in her life because of the lie that got caused her to think differently. So he used her weakness, her weakest point. All right, let's move on in the Old Testament and let's look at Achan. Unlike Eve, who became ignorant of God's will, Achan became incompetent of God's will. And Satan used what? His eye and the glitter of the gold and the shining silver and the designer clothing of the day. And he caused Achan to be incapable of obeying God's word. He was a trained soldier. He heard message after message from Moses and from Joshua. And yet, the very first battle, what was he doing? Disobeying. Caused great harm. 36 families that day lost their husband and their father. How sad that is. So what happened? He used his eye with Eve, mind with Achan, his eye with David, the pride of his heart. David became independent of God's will when he said, despite what Joab said in numbering Israel, I want to number Israel. And he was warned by his chief counselor and he overrode that counsel and his pride caused him to become independent of God's will. God warned him about counting. And then I want you to think with me, as I mentioned a few moments ago, about Job. Job nearly became impatient with God's will. Had his wife had her way, he would have become impatient. Why don't you curse God and die? What was Satan doing? He was using his body. He inflicted his body. So God works in the mind of a person. He works through the eye gate of a person. He works through the pride of his heart. And he works through his body. Now, I want to tell you something. Every one of us sitting here, we should be able to recall when Satan came and messed with your mind. When Satan came and tempted you through your eye gate. When Satan came and caused you to swell up with pride and arrogance. When he struck your body with a disease or had an accident that put you in the hospital or whatever it might have been with your body. I'm trying to get you to see and think that this is his method of operation. This is what he does. He is after us in every way to get us. He even had, are you ready for this? Now watch this. He even had the audacity to tempt Jesus. Took him up on the temple mount. The lust of the eyes, the pride of life. He tempted him and, and he did his best to get him from implementing the will of God for his life. And that was going to the cross and dying for our sins. From the beginning, from Genesis 3.15, historically speaking, prophetically speaking, he was after Jesus Christ to keep him from going to the cross and dying for our sins. And he did his very best to do it, and he failed miserably at it. Hallelujah, aren't you glad he did? So I'm trying to awaken you to the methods of operation, just like a criminal has a record with the FBI or the Troy Police Department. It's called an MO, his method of operation. Well, Satan has an MO, and that MO is to take us down. I want to remind you that Peter had no formal education, and yet Jesus worked with him time and time 
again, t- teaching him so many things. Peter made a lot of mistakes in his life. For instance, he was wrong about the crucifixion when Jesus said, I must needs go to Jerusalem and be crucified at the hands of man. man. Peter had the audacity to rebuke him. The Bible says that. Be it far from thee. He rebuked Jesus. He missed it. On the Mount of Transfiguration, he said, it's good for us to be here. Let's build three tabernacles. One for me and these two Old Testament prophets. See, Peter had a pride problem. Who was watching through the halls of time? Satan was. He was seeing exactly the weakness, weaknesses of Peter. When Jesus got in the middle of his ministry and set his disciples down in John 11 and girded himself with a towel and knelt down and washed their feet, Peter said, not me, Lord, I'm okay. But when Jesus finished with him, what did he say? Lord, not just my feet, but my hands, my whole body. Peter got it. He, Peter, this is why I, I have nothing negative to say about Peter. I see too much of myself in him. And perhaps you do too. He was wrong in the garden when he welded his sword and caught, cut off Melchizedek's ear. ear. And what did Jesus do? He picked it, his ear up, put it back on, and told Peter to put up his sword. He was wrong. He was wrong about John. He was jealous of John. And he asked Jesus one day, pointing to John, who is this man? Oh, was that a clue for Jesus to help him? You see, the devil was seeing all of these things and he was beginning to put together, hey, I got a disciple here that's walked with Jesus and he's got some weaknesses and I'm beginning to see them and I am gonna do my best to take him out, to take him down, to refuse to allow the Lord to continue using him. And so Peter made lots of mistakes. But I must say, on the flip side of that, there were many miracles of Peter's life also. You remember with me, he was first to bear witness of the deity of Christ when Jesus said, Who do men say that I am? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He had his theology right that day. He was right when he bore witness of the empty tomb running ahead of everyone else and stooping down. And the Bible says he beheld the linen clothes of Jesus. He was right when he preached the gospel after the ascension in Acts chapter 2. He endured the rage of early persecutors in Acts chapter 4. He welcomed the Gentiles into Christianity in Acts chapter 10 when he won Cornelius and his household. To show the early church that prayer did work in Acts chapter 12, when they opened the door and saw Peter, the Bible says the church was astonished. Isn't that just like us? Oh, we of little faith. And God was was using Peter. So Peter had weaknesses and Peter had strengths. Peter had lots of mistakes in his life like you and I, but he had lots of miracles in his life, and God was going to use him in a wonderful, wonderful way. Most of these miracles came on the heels of the greatest lesson that Peter learned as he warmed his feet at the devil's fire the night of our text. We didn't take the rest of the text and read it to the end of chapter 22. But we see that he was doing all that he could to attack his mind, his will, his heart, his conscience, and even his flesh. And you and I, Satan does the same thing. His goal is to destroy our Christian lives, to take us down, to cause us to fall, to destroy our marriage, to destroy our walk with the Lord, to destroy our children and our grandchildren. So Satan really unloaded on Peter that night. And you and I would be foolish to think if Peter who walked with him got caught up in this, if we, 
if we ever thought that this would never happen to us, that could become famous last words in your life and mine. We just can't think that. We can't have that mindset. So what I want us to do tonight is I want us to consider three simple thoughts from this passage of scripture. Now that we've got our mind around that and we've got that settled in our heart and how he hones in on our weaknesses, I want to pick this apart and show you just exactly how he worked in Peter's life. And I hope that it will awaken your conscience. I hope that you would feel the pressure upon you because none of us in this room within earshot of this message can make ourselves an exemption to this. So see with me, first of all, back in verse 33, the carnality of Simon. His statement was one of pride and his inability to see the sin of it. He was familiar with the book of Proverbs, Peter was. He knew the Lord hated a proud look, as Proverbs 6, 17 says. Peter knew that the Lord uh, looked at pride as an abomination, 16, verse 5. He knew the Bible commands us to hate pride, as it does in Proverbs 8, 13. And he warns us about the result of pride. It will bring shame. It will bring contention, and it will bring destruction. Peter knew that, and yet he still struggled. And the Bible warns us of how pride gets in our way. Anytime, let me help you with this. If you are argumentative, if you find yourself always arguing, that is a clear sign that you have pride in your heart because it's more important for you to win the argument. Pride. See, <clears throat> Some Christians would never commit adultery, but the sin of pride is condemned more in the Bible than adultery. Think about that. I'm saying to you, we're not an exemption from this. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. So the carnality of, of Simon he was full of himself in this incident. But see with me secondly, if you would please, the compelling interest of Satan. Now stay with me with this. That begins in verse 31. You see, the person of Satan, he's a real adversary. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. Beelzebub, prince of demons. Belial, you know what that means? Good for nothing. The wicked one. All of these names that's in the Bible for Satan should give us a holy hatred for him. And the reason that we allow ourselves a pass in this life is because we just think that we can get by with it, that it will be okay, and that we can exempt ourselves. He is the father of all lies. So he is a real person. May I say secondly about the devil, he has power. He has power, not just mere influence. He is a powerful spiritual being. And like an auger, he worms his way into our heart, turning every moment that he can, wiggling his way into our mind into our will, into our heart, into our conscience. I tell people this all the time. You know why God gave us a conscience? He didn't give us a conscience so that we could pat ourselves on the back and say, well, I did good, I, did, I was a good Christian today. You know why he gave us a conscience? He gave us a conscience because it's God's voice telling us when we sin. And when we will not pay attention to the natural voice that God gives every man, men go to hell because they will not listen to their conscience, which is God's booming voice. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. But they don't listen to him. Their consciences become hardened, the Bible says. Seared over. God gave us a conscience, conscience to tell us when we do wrong. 
And when we sear our conscience and when we throw our conscience away and when we don't care, when we, when we will not listen to our conscience, we listen, we are not listening to God. And he wants us to pay close attention to him. And Satan has power. He also, may I say, has a plan. It's threefold and it's in our text. Now this is the Bible, simple and plain. I like simple, I like plain. Don't, don't, don't uh, confuse me uh, with some deep theology. Just keep it simple. Let me show this to you from the Bible. His plan number one is the desire. Satan hath desired. Look at verse 31. Satan hath desired. The word desired means to make a demand in a forbidden way. The idea is to beg. The desire, it is the same. Matter of fact, the root word of the word desire is the English word in our Bible, lust. That's how strong a word that the Lord uses here in this passage. Satan literally lusts after causing you to fall. He, he is driven by bringing you down. He is driven by being sure you do not live a successful Christian life. He has a desire, a forbidden desire to take you down. And God does not, no more than he hits you over the head and makes you, makes you accept him as his savior, God expects you on your own free will to accept him as Savior. And he expects you by your own free will as a saved person to choose right over wrong. He expects that from us. And he gives us opportunity to prove ourselves. You see, this word desire stresses the inward impulse rather than the very object desired. It's an inward impulse. He was obsessed with it. That's why I said he's, he is observing us. And the word stresses that. Matter of fact, let me read to you a, a verse from the book of the Revelation that uses this same word. And you know it well. You listen as I read it. And in those days shall men, speaking about the tribulation period, shall men seek death and shall not find it. And shall desire to die. Desire to die and death shall flee from them. That's the same word. An uncontrolled desire. So be cautious. Be careful. He desires to have you. He desires to get you. He is lusting after you. He wants you to fall. He wants to bring you down. His desire is powerful. Secondly, will you see with me in this verse, his dictatorship. To have you. Satan hath desired to have you. Underscore that. Write that down in your notes. This phrase carries the idea to oppress us. And he wants to oppress the believer. Now watch this carefully. So he can operate our lives. To have you means he wants to operate you. He's the one that wants to dictate to you. Now, who is the supreme dictator? Who's our supreme example? Who should we be following the dictates of who? Jesus Christ and the word of God. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. This is what we should be following. This is who we follow. Not the devil. In his dictatorship, he seeks to operate us. As believers, he can't own us. But as a believer, he can oppress you. He can seek to turn your life. This is not a loss of salvation. I'm not preaching that. Nor is it, nor am I trying to say that Satan was possessing Peter at this time. Peter was a Christian just like you. He was a normal man just like you and I. And Satan wanted to do everything he possibly could in his power. He desired him. He wanted to dictate his life. He wanted to operate his life. 
But see with me thirdly in verse 31. To sift you as wheat. What does that mean? And why of all things does the Lord use these words for us? Now I want to tell you something. I want you to listen carefully. Because what I'm going to tell you next is the key as to whether or not you really are going to walk away from this sermon with, with doing the right thing. I want you to listen carefully. The word sift means to literally put into a sieve and to shake. The word is translated in our Bible, riddle. So Satan wants to put your life in his sieve and sift you, and he wants to make a riddle out of your life. Now, now are you ready for this? This phrase is telling us that Satan wants to make a fool of you. This is what sifting is. It makes a fool of some of the greatest Christians. All right, let's review. Peter. Peter walked on water, pillowed his head with the Lord, watched him perform miracles, went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter had all those experiences. And yet it came down to one night at a weak moment when Satan made a fool, made an absolute fool of Peter, a man who walked with Christ. Now you know your Bible well. You're well-taught people. If we spent time reading the rest of this chapter, and I encourage you to do it when you go home tonight, you will find that Peter denied his Lord after walking with him three and a half years. In a moment's time, just hours before the crucifixion, when Jesus would need him the most, he not only denied, but he lied. I never knew him. Oh, yes, you did. You are one of the Galileans. And the Bible says in Matthew that Peter cursed, denying and lying that he knew him. You and I would kind of bristle if I said to you tonight, you know, God uses men who realize they've been made a fool of and they get their heart right. What did Peter do at the end of this chapter? Peter went out and what did he do bitterly? He what? He wept. He wept. He had the heart of David when David committed his sin with Bathsheba. And he wept. And God taught Peter the greatest lesson of his life. He would stand in just 50 something days and preach a sermon after lying and denying and swearing. Aren't you glad God uses crooked sticks to draw straight lines with? Amen. We're all that way. Amen. Well, I want you to know, Pastor Arrowwood, I never cuss. No, but you think about it sometimes when you get mad. <laughs> and if you spit, the grass wouldn't grow where you spit. So what, I'm, what am I saying? I am saying none of us are above this that he may have you. Now, I want to show you something else. Now, stay with me, okay? Preacher, am I okay? Well, it's, uh, it's four minutes after eight. A few more minutes? Am I good? I don't want to overtax you here. Are you with me? You don't mind if I go another 30 minutes? I won't go that long. I want to show you something that's not in our English Bibles. And not that you have to know the Greek, and I, I'm not flaunting any of that, but I want to show you a play on words in this verse so that you can see how Satan zeroes in. Now watch this. Look at verse 31. See the, see the phrase, to have you? That is in the plural, in the language. It's speaking to what Satan wants to do to all the disciples. They were all there. 
He wants you. And he, he was reaching around all the disciples. He's saying to us, Satan wants you. He's reaching around the people in this room. Satan wants you. That's what he is saying. But then Jesus changes the tense in the next phrase. That he may sift you. And that is a personal pronoun reflecting specifically on Peter. So here's what he's saying. It would be like me saying, Satan wants all of you. But he wants you the most. He's your preacher. If he can get your preacher, he can get you. That's what he is saying. He is saying, when you're at home tonight, I want you to look at your family, look at your wife and your children, your husband. And I want you to remember, Satan's after all of us, but he's specifically after me. He's specifically after me. And when we understand the language like that, we can see how important it is for us not to deny this power that Satan has. And when Satan sifts us, he makes a fool of us. When Jesus Christ sifts us, he takes the chaff away. That's what he does. There's a difference between the two siftings. And Satan's sieve always looks inviting. It took Peter down a path that destroyed his testimony. And had he not went out and wept bitterly, we may not have ever had Acts chapter 2 and the great sermon that reaped 3,000 souls that day. God knew what he was doing and would even take a lying, cursing, denying preacher and use him for his honor and his glory. Let me show you the third thing in this verse, the destruction. Look at verse uh, 31, that he may sift you as wheat. So the compelling interest of Satan, the carnality of Simon, but look lastly, if you would, the compassion of our Savior. Go back, if you would, to verse 31. Simon, Simon, the inflection of his voice cut him to the heart. Simon, Simon. And then notice not only the inflection of his voice, but notice the intercessory prayer. I have prayed for thee. Jesus is our advocate, folks. He knows our weaknesses. And he's praying for Rick Arrowwood. He's praying for your pastor. He's praying for you. He knows your weakness. And he's praying for us. Can you imagine our Lord? We're being so important to him that he's praying for us. He's praying for you right now as you hear this simple message. He understands that Satan is after you. Now notice what he's praying that thy faith fail not. This was not saving faith. This was serving faith. He knew that Peter was going to be a great preacher. And he knew that he would be used mightily. And so, with his intercessory prayer, let me ask you a question. Did Jesus get his prayers answered with Peter? He did, didn't he? Sure he did. Thirdly, you will see his intriguing observation when thou art converted. You see, Peter was saved, but he needed converting. You say, that sounds like an oxymoron. Think about it. Understanding the words. I'm not trying to confuse you. The word convert means to turn around. Uh, the word convert has to do with when we repent. Like when we repent, we turn. So converting means to turn around. To repurpose your life for the glory of Christ. When you turn back to me again, notice the interesting goal. Strengthen thy brethren. The word strengthen means you'll be able, because you have turned, you'll be able to turn others resolutely in the right direction. Now, did Jesus get his prayers answered? 
Sure he did. Peter preached on Pentecost. One sermon, 3,000 souls got saved. Preacher, we preached 3,000 sermons hoping one person gets saved. Who else would better qualify to write two books in the New Testament warning us about the devil than Peter? And he gives us two epistles. He's the most qualified disciple that would be able to pin these words. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Peter gave us those words. Did you know that when Peter died at the age of 60, around the age of 67, after 30 years of ministry, and they wanted to crucify him on the cross, history says, Peter said, no, please. I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. And they turned him upside down and crucified him upside down. You think Peter learned his lessons? lesson? It's a far cry from warming your feet at the devil's fire, lying, denying, and swearing. Completely different person. All because he saw how Satan tried his best to take him out. Now, you can close your Bibles and bow your heads with me. And I'm going to ask Levanda to come and be ready to play an invitation hymn. Put your notebooks up. And I want you to stand with me, please. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I want you to take to heart the message tonight. What will you do with the truth you heard tonight? Would you be willing to say, Dear Lord, I realize that I have weaknesses, and I don't want those weaknesses to t take me out. I don't, want them, I don't want to destroy my family, my marriage, and my children. God, please help me. Would you be willing to say, I'm no exception. If Peter walked physically with Jesus and he couldn't do it, I'm no better than him. 